don't even go there. Don't even think about it. The number of times I've had people come up to me when I've been doing this and they go, Ah, Phil, caught you napping again then. I tell you what, if I'd had a five pound note for every time I'd heard that, I'd be a rich man. The joke's worn off. Yep, I am. I'm napping flints. Just a bit of recreational napping, to be bluntly honest. Just sitting here, trying to recreate an event that happened, oh, I don't know, 13,000 years ago, something like that. Towards the end of the last Ice Age, long time ago, but made by somebody that I could relate to. What I've been doing is, is, is making, making blades, we call them. These long, thin, slender pieces of flint. It's the same technology that they were using in, in the, uh, at the end of the Ice Age. Funnily enough, it's exactly the same technology that the flint nappers were using at Brandon in the 1800s to make gun flints for Wellington's army at Waterloo. So this technology might go back tens of thousands of years, but believe you me, it's still relevant. And the people we were digging up, well, let's put it this way, the site. Site was a place called Farndon Fields in Nottinghamshire, just south of Newark. You probably haven't heard of it. I'd never really heard of it to make much sense of it. And when we got there, it was just a ploughed field. You could, you could drive through there and you wouldn't know it was there. We were there to reroute the line of the A46 from Leicester up to Newark. And from an archaeological point of view, it's an incredibly important site because people, archaeologists, had been finding flints there that dated to that remote time, the end of the last ice age, the end of the Paleolithic, as we like to call it. And Britain at that stage was an incredibly different place to what we know now. Vast amounts of it was still covered in ice and the country itself was pretty much uninhabited. Everybody had moved south onto the continent. But periodically, the ice, shift, the ice cap shifted back northwards and allowed people to come back in. And these were the people that had come back in to live at Farndon. Now, to kind of put you into some sort of perspective with these people, they were pretty much the same sort of colleagues, as you might say, contemporaries as the people who were creating all those wonderful, wonderful images of prehistoric animals on the cave walls of France and Spain that were painted there in beautiful colours. Bison, mammoths and, and elk and God knows what else, all these wonderful creatures. In fact, they did actually bring their art up to Britain because there's a site in Derbyshire, Creswell, just up the road from Farndon, actually, and they were living in caves there, and they were inscribing outlines of prehistoric animals on the cave walls. So, how do we know that what all this was going on, and what does it mean to me? Why is it so important to me? Well, to me, the most important discovery we found there was the place where somebody napped flint. He sat there, just as I'm doing, and created stone tools and walked away. Now, that gives me a great deal of satisfaction and personal contact with somebody who actually lived 13,000 years ago. We were very, very lucky to find this, this area. Uh, the road company said, well, where the road is going to go, the carriageway, we're not going to dig there. We're going to build an embankment over the top. So no damage to the archaeology. We ain't paying for any work there. Oh. So where can we dig? Well, we've got these drainage ditches running up and down either side of the carriageway. So that's where we were restricted. At one point, we put in a machine dug trench with a digger through the line of this, this uh, drainage ditch. And funnily enough, sticking out the side of the trench was a flint. Now, 
on the surface of it, you'd think, well, what's so important about that? I'll tell you what, that was seriously important. Why? <laughs> it was the only flint we found in, the, in any of those things sticking out the side of the trench. So we got quite excited about that. We said, well, there might be something here worth finding. So we opened up an area, well, probably jigger no more than about the size of this bed sheet, I don't reckon. I mean, I'm, you've got this sheet down here to catch my own waist because I don't want to leave... Uh, flint chippings lying about. Anyway, we opened up at this area and we were, we were, we were digging away there very, very gently, very, very steady, just taking it down spit by spit by spit. This is where discipline comes in in archaeology. This is why you have to be disciplined in archaeology. It's one of the reasons people say to me, how does it work like working with the army? And I say, pretty easy, because they're disciplined individuals in, at the end of the day. They get used to taking orders. I don't give orders. I just request people to do it, and I expect them to obey my requests. But the, sim the symbol thing is the same thing. You work nice and disciplined. You take it down nice and steady. You work in a clean fashion. And we were doing that. And then we were able, by doing that, we were able to find little tiny chippings, no bigger than that. And by being detailed about what we were doing, every flint that was bigger than 10 millimetres long, which isn't very big, that was plotted in three dimensions. We knew exactly where it was coming. And we gridded the whole area in little tiny grid squares, and we lifted all the spoil out of each square, bagged it up, took it back to the laboratory, and sieved it down to a one millimeter mesh. And then from there, we found out how much flint chippings was in each individual square, and we were able to build up a pattern. And what we found was exactly like what I've got between my feet here, a very, very tight cluster a flint nap in debris. And we found that we, we could identify where it had fanned out from that central concentration and where it had fanned out with these extra bits that had just dropped off a bit further away. And from that, we were able to tell exactly where the flint napper had sat and how he'd worked and how he'd made his tools and all the rest of it. And now, because I'm a flint napper, it gives me that opportunity to judge the efficiency and the skill level of that other napper. That's what's so wonderful about what I do, that I can experience everything that they went through. It's almost as though where they're sitting there, I'm able to stand by the side of them and look over their shoulder and think to myself, ah, you ain't bad, my old mate, you ain't bad. And so what we found was an incredibly small amount of very, very fine chippings. They were the bits where he'd literally taken his block of flint and his hammer, and he's just preparing round the edge, just dri just tripling round the side there, preparing to knock off a blade. And the blades, they got these wonderful sharp edges all the way down both sides. And you can also use them to make arrowheads, you can make them into scrapers, you can make them into piercing tools and all manner of other, other tools. They are a most wonderful way of being efficient with a piece of flint. And so what we think is that these people were moving in, they were moving across the landscape. The flint was really good quality material. It would come from probably Lincolnshire, 60 kilometres away, perhaps 40 miles away. They're bringing in this stuff because it's good quality flint. It's worth having. They don't waste it. They don't waste it. If there was any more of it, they kept it and moved on with it. They didn't want to lose. They weren't going to throw away a good piece of raw material. Very, very economical with their, their raw material. What sort of people were they? Well... Great strategists as military people, you'd appreciate what they were up to. Because Farnham Fields comes at the confluence of two rivers, the Devon and the Trent. And that pinch point is the sort of area that animals, the game that they were hunting, bit of a bit of horse, 
bit of red deer was what they were hunting, they could corral them into that pinch point and they'd be ready there for the taking. So they were good military people as well. Now, all in all, it enabled me to associate with my with my ancestors. When I started napping, I used to think oh, I could make an arrowhead or an axe head and all the rest of it. That doesn't really seem to matter so much these days. What does matter is being able to link in with my prehistoric ancestors. So what's that got to do with you and Waterloo? Actually, pretty much everything, apart from the obvious one, that without the Brandon gunflint nappers, Wellington wouldn't have had any gunflints for his muskets, and who knows, Waterloo might have ended up totally different. But just as I can link to my ancestors through flint napping, Many of you will be able to link to your ancestors, your military ancestors, through your own experience. You've all had discipline instilled into you. You all know the value of looking after your weapons, just as Wellington's army had to look after his muskets, just as the, uh, the Dutch would have had to look after their weapons, and the French as well. It enables you to associate with people who were on that battlefield in 1815, by your own experience. So, if you're in a trench and you're digging away there and you find a musket ball, don't just think, ooh, I found a musket ball. Take it a little bit further. Think about the poor devil who had to ram that down the muzzle of his musket, the, the, the fame, the, the, how he felt as he fired that off. And spare a thought for that man at the battle in 1815. <laughs> so, at the end of a successful session of napping, our Stone Age napper collected up his raw material, his hammer, his blades that would actually make future tools. He was a very happy napper. It had been a really successful session. All he left behind was a small heap of waste for the archaeologists to find.